guys. Today it's time to have another conversation about the worthless people. This is something I've talked about in the past. I haven't talked about it recently, but I was doing some research. As you know, recently we've had two mass shootings pop up in the national media. But here's the thing you didn't know. We've had 27 mass shootings this year. That's one per week. So we gotta ask ourselves, why are mass shootings increasing? I actually see it where we're gonna have two or three mass shootings per week in the future, and I'm gonna explain why. But first, let's do the basic analysis of the people who are committing these mass shootings. Every time they catch one of these guys, if he doesn't get shot at the scene of the crime, it is a worthless person. What is a worthless person? This is a person who doesn't contribute to society. This is a person who has nothing going on, and this is a person who doesn't care about themselves. So therefore, they don't care about you. And there's a lot of things going on with the worthless people in terms of I want to identify one of the major components of worthless people. And some people may have a problem with me putting these people in the category. And it is mental illness. Years and years ago, I used to be homeless, but I didn't stay homeless forever and ever because I didn't have a substance abuse problem and I didn't have mental illness. And typically people who fall into homelessness without a substance abuse problem or mental illness is not that long. They don't fall into being homeless for years and years and years. Uh, there was a guy here on YouTube that some who was homeless and this guy taught him how to do computer coding, got him a laptop, got him some classes. And this guy had an apartment. He was kind of back into mainstream America, right? And then a few weeks later, after he got the apartment, this guy was homeless again. So after having help, given the computer, being taught to code, this guy returned back to homelessness because I feel he's mentally ill. And this is a big, big component with worthless people. There is a lot of mental illness out here. There's a ton of people who have psychosis, they're bipolar. Um, I'll share some personal with you. I used to date someone that was mentally ill and you know, it would come in spells. There would be days that she was my sweet loving girlfriend and there was days that she was this other person and this other person was mean, hateful, would say the most horrible things. And then she would go through, um, I don't know, episodes. Let's not say spells, let's say episodes. And I remember one night she's talking about, I don't wanna live. And when you're dealing with someone who's mentally ill, you don't know how to handle it. I, I, I did not know what to do. And I was just like, maybe you need to see somebody. And she wouldn't go. So one of the big issues with worthless people in mental illness is they know that something's wrong. They are acutely aware that something's wrong and they don't want to get help. Give you an example, and it's a good example. How many of you are familiar with the show Ozark? Ozark, uh, one of the main characters, the wife of the money laundering dude, <clears throat> Uh, her brother was mentally ill and this guy met someone and because his medication made him impotent, he came off his medication and he freaked the hell out. Once again, 
He knew he was mentally ill. He knew the medication kept him stable, but because he wanted to hit some trim, he came off his medication. And this is a big, big problem with the mentally ill. They know that they're messed up, but they don't want to, there, there's a term, a non-compliant patient. This is someone like me. I had a heart attack um, two going on three years ago. And part of my daily regimen is to take my medication. I take my medication in the morning. I take my medication in the evening. I am a compliant patient, which is the reason that I've not had any uh, reoccurring episodes because I take my medication every day on time without fail because I'm a compliant patient. Many of these mentally ill people are non-compliant. They will not take their meds. And then they will put a guilt trip on their family because essentially he lost his mind. And th th this is what this dude did. He went to the lawyer of the drug cartel and told her daughter that her mom was in a drug cartel. And up until that moment, her daughter didn't know. And then he, he just, he showed out, he showed his ass. And then the sister takes him because at this point, the cartel has a hit on him. And his sister drives out of town. What is he doing? He's buying burner phones to call the drug cartel lawyer to say, hey, I apologize. And she is trying to save his life but he actually goes into a Walmart and tells people that people, those people, the cartel are after him and trying to kill him. So she's trying to save his life and he is actively working against her. And this is what you will find with mental illness. Uh, you, you do have some people who know they're mentally ill and they have a drug protocol and they take their meds and they're fine. But you have people who are mentally ill who will not take their meds who will not be on the protocol. And this is what I saw with this guy who was homeless. Someone, and th this is one of the reasons, cause you know, a lot of you people think that I'm heartless because I don't feel that throwing money at a problem, like this guy gave this guy a computer and paid for him to take coding classes and taught him how to code and got him an apartment. And within weeks of arriving back into mainstream America, because he had a, he had new skills, he was back to being homeless. He's like, you know, he, he did a video talking about where is he? I don't know. He's not at the apartment. He went back to being homeless. And this is why you cannot help people who don't want to be helped. And I know that sounds coldless, cold and heartless, because every day, every time I go toward the airport, I see all of these tents under the underpass. And I know that the majority of people living in these tents have a mental illness. Not all, but most of them. Most of them have a mental illness. And if you go to Skid Row, uh, there's a home, large homeless population in Arizona right now. You will find, because essentially what happens is these people slip out of normal society. So let's say you have someone, and once again, there's another YouTube video. This guy brought in this homeless couple. This guy was rich and he brought this homeless couple into his house and they were in his spare bedroom. It was a lot of issues and consequences because when you're used to living on the street, you're not used to having a bathroom. You're not used to having running water. You're not used to having what many of us take for granted. I got three bathrooms up in here. Uh, you're not used to that. You're used to getting out your tent, going around the corner, copping the squat, not even having toilet paper. And that's how you've been living like a savage. So he brought these homeless people into his house and there was a lot of problems because they were not adjusted to normalcy. 
Because, you know, he was like, they would sleep in the, during the day and they'd be up all night. That's what they were doing when they were homeless because they would sleep during the day when it was hot and they would be up at night when it was cool. And one of the things that you're going to see, and this is something that I do, I do some criminal uh, profiling. One of the things I have noticed, uh, I live in a very expensive place, but guess what? There are worthless people in this building. I'm gonna tell you, down the hall we have a trash chute. And I don't know how many times I've gone to this trash chute and I would see a bag of trash. Last time I saw two bags of trash in the box. Now, I know that may say, wait a minute, why would you consider this person a worthless person? I'm gonna tell you why. The trash bags would have fit in the trash chute. And the box, I actually end up putting the box down the trash chute because with these worthless people, they don't wanna do right. They can't do right. Once again, this is an incredible point. They cannot do things in a normal manner. They cannot do things correctly. They cannot. And I, I've got some situations where there's some people in this building and I'm just wondering, and they're, they're living with someone. They don't, their name's probably not on the lease. They're living with someone. And I would not be surprised if it's one of the people that I've identified as someone who doesn't belong here, who actually did that. Because with worthless people, common decency, simple, goes out the window. Now, I know you're like, all right, you're talking about someone left some trash in the trash chute. How does that end up with uh, mass shootings? And I'm about to make the connection. How many of you watch Criminal Minds and when they do these profiles? All of these serial killers started their proclivities as children. Their childhood is what made them into a serial killer. So it's the little things stacked up over time that creates a serial killer or a mass shooter. This isn't something that happens like overnight, like someone just wakes up one day and is like, I'm gonna go kill a bunch of people. No, 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 no. This is something that has been brewing for years. And it starts with simple little stuff. Like I'll give you an example. I've been checking out my DoorDash delivery people, and it's pretty interesting. There are some DoorDash people who represent quite well. They shave, they dress in a normal manner. Not to say, you're, you're not, you're, they're not wearing um, exotic or um, high-end clothing, but when they show up, they look normal and presentable. Now there's another class of DoorDash that looks like, I'm gonna give you an example of this guy I saw. He was about 6'4", 6'5", uh, fro, hair not combed, nothing. And he was overweight. He had on a tight shirt, some short shorts. Not shorts, but short shorts, because his butt was hanging out. And he had on some slides and his toenails were hideously long. This guy looked like he didn't give a damn about his appearance. And this was a DoorDash driver and I was just sitting there like, good Lord. See, it's these little things, it's these little things that build up over time that create, because every time, once again, with the mass shooters, if he isn't killed at the scene of the crime and they get into his profile, the person's fucked up. And with the great reset, with everything that we have going on, we're gonna have, we're going to be creating more of these potential mass shooters and mentally ill people because of the breakdown of the family. When I was a kid, everybody in the neighborhood knew who I was. They knew who I was, they knew my mother, they knew my grandmother, they knew my grandfather, they knew my people. And there was a sense of community. And even though we were poor, lawns were cut, there was no trash. It was a poor but respectably well-groomed community. 
Kids don't have that in mass. There are some kids that have those communities, kids who grow up in small farming towns or small towns, they still have that. But a lot of kids are the product of a single mother with no village, no help, and they have the internet. And the internet is the breeding ground for mental dysfunction. It is, I'm about to explain to you why. And it is the recruitment for people who are mentally fragile, who have mental illness into these conspiracy theories. So you've got, with the breakdown of the family unit, we have a literal breeding ground for these worthless people. And I'm gonna tell you, remember the whistleblower for Facebook? how she got in trouble when she said that Facebook had data that Instagram was mentally harming young women. They knew it and they kept doing what they were doing. Once again, and right now, there's something going on with boys. With the lack of a strong masculine role model, these boys are lost. They're confused and they're turning to dangerous activities because years and years ago, I was dating this girl and she had a daughter and I had um, some boys and she's like, I don't know what the, how, this boy energy is so different than girl energy. You cannot treat boys and girls in the same way in an educational setting. You cannot. Boy energy is different than girl energy. And since we're trying to force everyone to be the same and be treated the same, except if you're a trans, if you're a trans kid, you have the carpet rolled out for you. But if you're a boy and someone's like comes to school and talks about you being masculine, they're going to shut that down. But if you're a boy and you want to wear a dress, they're going to support and embrace that, which is part of the dysfunction. And I'm about to say something about trans. I feel, and this is once again, the express opinion of Glendon Cameron. I feel that if you feel that you're trans, you cannot start transitioning until you're 18. Right now, we have people who are transitioning at nine years old. And there was a study done of people who had transitioned and how many of them regretted it but you don't hear about that. So I would, if I had a kid who's like, hey, I had a little boy and he's like, man, I feel like a girl. I was like, you know what? I can understand and appreciate what you're saying, but you know what? We're gonna do this boy thing until you're 18. We're gonna do this boy thing until you're out of my house and you can do what you wanna do because you biologically are a boy. And I don't know if it's a phase and everything. I love you, I will support you but you're gonna be a boy while you're in my house. I know that just pisses off a lot of people right now, but I have read the studies of how many folks who had transitioned and later on realized that they were gay. And there was one person who actually had the sexual reassignment surgery at 18, 19, and when they were 25, they realized that they were gay and they were depressed, and this person committed suicide because they had cut their dick off. So, with all that we're having, with the lack of a family unit, with the lack, with the, let's call it the rah-rah culture. If you wanna be strange, odd, or whatever, that's cool. But if you wanna be a, a traditionally masculine man, that's toxic. And I'm gonna say something. You can research this. You could go back to the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, the 60s, when this non when this toxic culture, when homosexuality wasn't embraced, trans wasn't even a thing. If you look at the number of suicides, because when I was a kid, Mentally ill people did not commit murder. They were mentally ill, but they knew that if they committed a murder, 
that they would be in that electric chair and it's like, Psh! they knew that they did, they knew there was consequences for their behavior with this new crop of mentally ill people in this general acceptance of virtually anything. Um, there does like the guy who killed those people in South Carolina, the cops took him to McDonald's. They took him to McDonald's. So what the mentally ill have an understanding of this America is that they can kill people. They can rob people. They can do all kinds of stuff. And there's not a lot of consequences. Whereas in the America that I grew up in, I don't care if you were butt naked crazy. If you kill someone, they put your ass in the chair. And the crazy people like, I might be crazy, but I ain't stupid. And I feel that once all of this reaches ahead, because we're about to go through a 10 year transformation in this country. We got the global reset. We've got the shifting of the economy. We have the shifting of monetary policy. We have the shifting of currency and we have the shifting of social mores. And when we get to the point, because we are almost there, we've had 27 mass shootings this year. It's May. This is only the fifth month of the year. So we're on pace to have 60 something mass shootings this year, which is more than one a week because we only have 52 weeks in a year. So when we get to the point, and I hope that we don't get to this point, but we get to the point where we have two and three mass shootings a week, because right now we have what's called an acceptable loss of life. Right now, 19 little kids gunned down, we can, all right, we ain't gonna change the gun laws because of the second amendment. We're not gonna change the gun laws. And what produces change and um, change of policy, a change of behavior is pain. And when we get to two the four mass shootings per week, you better believe we're going to see a change in gun control. Right now, as long as it's like one mass shooting a week, nothing gonna change, nothing gonna change. Uh, this is something that I learned in the storage auction business. If you buy a gun from a gun store, you have to have a background check. But if you go to a gun show, you can buy a gun legally without a background check Go to a gun show on Saturday, buy your gun, take it home. And also, this is something else that, you know, I learned in the storage auction business. I have had 250 guns that I got out of the storage units. And there is a big market for a gun that's not in the system that you can like, I had a 357 Magnum, a Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry Magnum. These guns were really expensive. And I had someone pay me $3,500 because they wanted that 357 and they didn't want it to be, quote, in the system. He said, I wanted to have a powerful throwaway gun. And this is like, like I can just tell you from experience. And one of the things that I stopped doing and I never really was big on this. I didn't advertise that I sold guns. I typically sold guns to people that I knew. And I feel this is why I never got jammed up because you can sell a gun to someone you don't know and they can do something stupid with that gun and then they can come back on you and it would be an illegal sale of a gun where you can get in trouble. And I didn't, I didn't need that kind of heat in my life. I just like, no, no, no. Because essentially at one point I was sitting on about 65 guns. Uh, I had at one point 30 M16s. 30. Now it wasn't M16, it's a fully automatic rifle. And these are quite easy to sell. <laughs> there, if you, because at this point, 
Legally, I don't know what they're selling for now, but legally, uh, I found a gun dealer and uh, he ran the numbers and make sure, because you know, when I brought them to him, he's like, are they stolen? That was his first question. I said, I don't know. And what he, I gave him the serial numbers and he ran all the serial numbers and they weren't stolen. So he sold the guns for me and he sold these guns for $25,000 a piece. That was the legal market, the legal market. So in this country, in the United States of America in 2022, virtually anyone can get a gun if they know where to go. So what I predict is going to happen as we move into this global reset, this 10 year transformation period, because right now uh, I haven't been keeping up with it. I don't know if Roe versus Wade got overturned. I have no clue. I haven't checked on that. So let me know in the comments. But if the pain, see, that's the key. The pain has to get high enough where if you're a normal person and let, let's just say we're getting to the point where we have in a seven day week, we have four mass shootings per week and that's the constant theme. You will see gun laws change at that point because the average person is going to feel unsafe and even the second amendment gun toting folks are going to have a change of heart because right now the way it is, if we only have one mass shooting per week, that's an acceptable loss of life and nothing's going to change. But if that four X's where if you, where people start to get touched, let's say you were a gun toting second amendment advocate and your mother and father get killed in a mass shooting. That's going to change how you feel. You know, you may be dying in the wool. You got your NRA card and all this other stuff. But mom and dad get gunned down in a restaurant with 40 other people with a guy who got an automatic weapon at a gun show. Who was who has a record of mental illness. That's going to change your thought process, because once again, pain, you know, even with me, like what did it take for me to change my ways? Having a heart attack, pain. Um, so once the pain gets great enough, this is when we will see pronouns change, but not a minute before, not a minute before. So right now we have an incubator, a literal breeding ground of worthless people who, because this, this is something else that I, I just kind of wonder what's going to happen because like, I don't know if I'm going to stay here because I like the place, but I don't like the environment because like someone came to see me and someone just let her up on the elevator. She didn't even go to the concierge and I'm just sitting there like that, that kind of defeats one of the reasons I moved here and I'm just sitting there. But once again, she was cute. <laughs> Dudes do shit for cute women. If she had been fat and overweight, she would never got let up. So, um, it, it, it's crazy, but in the coming future, the rich are going to work very hard to separate themselves from common folk because in the mix of common folks are going to be a bunch of worthless people. You cannot just look at someone as like, Hey, that's a worthless person. You just can't do it. But the risk is going to be too great. The risk is going to be just too great. So you're just not going to affiliate. And what I see, like, I kind of see myself moving back into a house because um, this is something else. Even though I live in Buckhead, I don't really, this, this is one of the things I've experienced in Buckhead. Customer service is either amazing or it's trash. There's no middle ground. And I could frequently find myself going back to Sandy Springs where customer service 10 times out of 10 is excellent. So. I don't know if I'm going to renew my lease or I, I, I have no clue. I'm not there yet, but I can say that there are worthless people in this building. There are worthless people and I don't know where they are on the scale of being worthless 
versus still being stable. But I do know that we have worthless people in this building. People who will not act right. Like this is something else too. We have gates. We have these wooden arms. Like when you go to the garage, the wooden gate goes up. At least once or twice a month, someone breaks those gates. All you gotta do is pull. Because we have people. I'm gonna tell you what I feel is happening. We have a lot of people around here who do weed. And we have some highly productive people doing weed. And we have some worthless people doing weed. And consistently, I go up there and that gate's like broken because somebody cannot wait until it lets itself up and they hit it and they break it. And that behavior is common. Um, recently, they had to change the parking situation because people were letting folks, because this is kind of a central location and a lot of people were letting their friends park in the garage. And they, they had to change that because people don't want to do right. People love to trick on someone else's dime. It's like, oh yeah, 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 you can stay in the, yeah, yeah, I'll let you into the garage. Even though they shouldn't be in the garage. And what I see is the leaks, the rank and file of the worthless people exploding during um, this global reset. I see them exploding because the framework of society is disintegrating. It's just disintegrating. You know, it's real interesting. And I know a lot of you are going to be throwing stuff at me and everything, but I consistently see this theme of extremely successful men. They're married. They're married. Like uh, there's one gentleman that watches the channel, the Wall Street, not the Wall Street, the real estate trapper. He's got a channel. He is young man and he's been married like 10, 12 years. And this is constant. I consistently see this, that really successful young men get married. And I'm going to tell you why I feel that he's successful. Uh, he has a very attractive wife and he come out and he go to work. He ain't out looking for no trim. He ain't out playing in these streets. He is working on his business. And a lot of you will disagree with me because they ain't gonna never get no married. They ain't never getting married, man. They ain't getting married. Nope, nope, nope. I'm just gonna be a 75 year old man with my dog Pinto eating beans out of a can. But what I have seen across the board, most of my wealthy friends are married. Like I would say 90% of them. And there's about 10% of us in the group who are not married. And one man, gentleman, uh, out those, a lot of these guys are older and their wives died. So they were at one point married. And what I'm seeing in this global reset in the disintegration of society is that the rich, the real estate trapper is rich and he's married. That's gonna be a consistent theme. And I know a lot of you going to throw rocks and a lot of you going to boo haul that stuff with your broke asses, with your broke asses. You, you just can see this is something else kind of going back to the mentally ill who know they mentally ill, but don't want to do what they need to do from taking their drug regimen or being on a protocol. It's like a lot of you know you live in file, you know, you live in file but you don't want to change because you're having too much fun being you. So during this great disintegration, I predict next two, three years, we're going to have two, three, four mass shootings per week. And at that point, you're going to see it at a congressional level, a lot of action because what, because it's going to be pain. Because when you start having that many people die per week, that's a lot of pain. And pain produces change. Like it, like I said, if the uh, mass shootings stay where they are, nothing's going to change. Right now, this day, you can go to a gun show and buy a gun without a background check. Most people in America, if they know where to go, they can get a gun without a background check. 
And what we're going to have to do, and this is one of the things, is we're going to have to get rid of gun shows. We're going to have to get rid of gun shows because these guys are used to selling guns without doing any due diligence or protocols. So we're going to have to get, it's going to have to be the point that the only place that you can get a gun is from a registered gun dealer. And probably what's going to happen is there's going to be a seven day waiting period. You, you will get in the system and then seven days later, you go back and pick up your gun. I predict that's what we're, we're heading to at some point in the future. Like right now, the gun lobby is extremely powerful, but once the pain starts to happen, once that pain starts to happen, that's when we're going to see some change. So this video is part of a playlist and I'm going to put the playlist in the first comment. So you should watch all of the videos in this playlist because I'm talking about different kind of stuff. And I think that you would like it. So that's all I got for you guys. I will talk to you in the next one.